Berbers, Wikipedia article audio. Berbers or Mazais are an ethnic group indigenous to North Africa, primarily inhabiting the Maghreb. They are distributed in an area stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Siwa Oasis in Egypt, and from the Mediterranean Sea to the Niger River in West Africa. Historically, they spoke Berber languages, which together form the Berber branch of the Afro-Asiatic family. Since the Muslim conquest of North Africa in the 7th century, a large number of Berbers inhabiting the Maghreb have in varying degrees used as lingua franca the other languages spoken in North Africa. After the colonization of North Africa by France, the French government succeeded in integrating the French language in Algeria by making French the official national language and requiring all education to take place in French. Foreign languages, mainly French and to some degree Spanish, inherited from former European colonial powers, are used by most educated Berbers in Algeria and Morocco in some formal contexts, such as higher education or business. Most Berber people live in North Africa, mainly in Libya, Algeria, Tunisia and Morocco. Small Berber populations are also found in Niger, Mali, Mauritania, Burkina Faso, and Egypt, as well as large immigrant communities living in France, Canada, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, and other countries of Europe. Name Prehistory The majority of Berbers are Sunni Muslim. The Berber identity is usually wider than language and ethnicity, and encompasses the entire history and geography of North Africa. Berbers are not an entirely homogeneous ethnicity and they encompass a range of societies and ancestries. The unifying forces for the Berber people may be their shared language, or a collective identification with Berber heritage and history. There are some 25 to 30 million Berber speakers in North Africa. The number of ethnic Berbers is far greater, as a large part of the Berbers have acquired other languages over the course of many decades or centuries, and no longer speak Berber today. The majority of North Africa's population is believed to be Berber in origin, although due to Arabization most ethnic Berbers identify as Arabaized Berbers. Berbers call themselves some variant of the word Imazayan, possibly meaning free people or noble men. The name probably had its ancient parallel in the Roman and Greek names for Berbers, Mazuses. Some of the best known of the ancient Berbers are the Numidian king Masinissa, King Jugurtha, the Berber Roman author Apuleius, St. Augustine of Hippo, and the Berber Roman general Lucius Quietus, who was instrumental in defeating the major wave of Jewish revolts of 115-117. Dihia or Kahina was a religious and military leader who led a fierce Berber resistance against the Arab Muslim expansion in northwest Africa. Qusela was a 7th century leader of the Araba tribe of the Berber people and king of the Sanyajia confederation. Yusuf ibn Tashfin was king of the Berber al Moravid dynasty, Tariq ibn Ziad the general who conquered Hispania, Abbas ibn Firnas, a prolific inventor and early pioneer in aviation, ibn Batida, a medieval explorer who travelled the longest known distances of his time. The name Berber derives from an ancient Egyptian language term meaning outlander or variations thereof. The exonym was later adopted by the Greeks, with a similar connotation. Among its oldest written attestations, Berber appears as an ethnonym in the 1st century AD Peri plus of the Erythrian Sea. Despite these early manuscripts, Certain modern scholars have argued that the term only emerged around 900 AD in the writings of Arab genealogists, with Maurice Lenore positing an 8th or 9th century date of appearance. The English term was introduced in the 19th century, 
replacing the earlier Barbary. History The Berbers are the Mori cited by the Chronicle of 754 during the Umayyad conquest of Hispania, to become since the 11th century the catch-all term Moros on the charters and chronicles of the expanding Christian Iberian kingdoms to refer to the Andalusi, the North Africans, and the Muslims overall. For the historian Abraham Isaac Laredo the name Amazai could be derived from the name of the ancestor Mazag which is the translation of biblical ancestor Dadan son of Sheba in the Targum. According to Leo Africanus, Amazai meant free man, though this has been disputed, because there is no root of MZGH meaning free in modern Berber languages. This dispute, however, is based on a lack of understanding of the Berber language as M is a prefix meaning a man, one who is therefore, the root required to verify this endonym would be Zai, free, which however is also missing from Tamazite's lexicon, but may be related to the well-attested A's strong, tizit bravery, or jegag to be brave, to be courageous. Origins Further, it also has a cognate in the Tuareg word amajeg, meaning noble. This term is common in Morocco, especially among Central Atlas, Rifian, and Sheila speakers in 1980, but elsewhere within the Berber homeland sometimes a local, more particular term, such as Kabyle or Chewi, is more often used instead in Algeria. The Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, and Byzantines mentioned various tribes with similar names living in Greater Libya in the areas where Berbers were later found. Later tribal names differ from the classical sources, but are probably still related to the modern Amazai. The Meshwish tribe among them represents the first thus identified from the field. Scholars believe it would be the same tribe called a few centuries afterwards in Greek as Mazes by Hectaeus and as Maxes by Herodotus, while it was called after that Mazax and Mazax in Latin sources, and related to the later Masilii and Masizili. All those names are similar and perhaps foreign renditions of the name used by the Berbers in general for themselves, Imazion. The Maghreb region in northwestern Africa is believed to have been inhabited by Berbers from at least 10,000 BC. Local cave paintings, which have been dated to 12 millennia before present, have been found in the Tassili Anajar region of southern Algeria. Other rock art has been observed in Tadrat Akakis in the Libyan desert. A Neolithic society, marked by domestication and subsistence agriculture, developed in the Saharan and Mediterranean region of northern Africa between 6000 and 2000 BC. This type of life, richly depicted in the Tassili Anajar cave paintings of southeastern Algeria, predominated in the Maghreb until the Classical period. Prehistorical Tafanak scripts were also found in the Oran region. During the pre-Roman era, several successive independent states existed before the King Masinissa unified the people of Numidia. Antiquity In historical times, the Berbers expanded south into the Sahara. Much of Berber culture is still celebrated among the cultural elite in Morocco and Algeria. Numidia the areas of North Africa that have retained the Berber language and traditions best have been, in general, Morocco and the Hauts Plains of Algeria, most of which in Roman and Ottoman times had remained largely independent. The Ottomans did penetrate the Kabylie area, and to places the Phoenicians never penetrated, far beyond the coast, where Turkish influence can be seen in food, clothes, and music. These areas have been affected by some of the many invasions of North Africa, most recently that of the French. Mauritania Around 5000 BC, 
the populations of North Africa were primarily descended from the makers of the Ibero-Morrisian and Capsian cultures, with the more recent intrusion associated with the Neolithic Revolution. The Proto-Berber tribes evolved from these prehistoric communities during the Late Bronze to Early Iron Age. Uniparental DNA analysis has established ties between Berbers and other Afro-Asiatic speakers in Africa. Most of these populations belong to the E1B1B paternal Hapla group, with Berber speakers having among the highest frequencies of this lineage. Additionally, genomic analysis has found that Berber and other Maghreb communities are defined by a shared ancestral component. This Maghrebi element peaks among Tunisian Berbers. It is related to the Coptic slash Ethiosomali, having diverged from these and other West Eurasian affiliated components prior to the Holocene. Middle Ages In 2013, ibero morrisian skeletons from the prehistoric sites of Taforalt and Afalo in the Maghreb were also analyzed for ancient DNA. All of the specimens belonged to maternal clades associated with either North Africa or the northern and southern Mediterranean littoral, indicating gene flow between these areas since the Epipaleolithic. The ancient Taforalt individuals carried the mtDNA haplogroups U6, H, JT, and V, which points to population continuity in the region dating from the ibero morrisian period. Human fossils excavated at the Afri NAMR or Mouses site in Morocco have been radiocarbon dated to the early Neolithic period, ca. 5000 BC. Ancient DNA analysis of these specimens indicates that they carried paternal haplotypes related to the E1B1B1B1 a subclade and the maternal haplogroups U6A and M1, all of which are frequent among present day communities in the Maghreb. These ancient individuals also bore an autochthonous macrobigenomic component that peaks among modern Berbers, indicating that they were ancestral to populations in the area. Additionally, fossils excavated at the Caliph El Burod site near Rabat were found to carry the broadly distributed paternal haplogroup TM184 as well as the maternal haplogroups K1, T2 and X2 the latter of which were common mtDNA lineages in Neolithic Europe and Anatolia. These ancient individuals likewise bore the Berber-associated macrobigenomic component. This altogether indicates that the late Neolithic Caliph El Burod inhabitants were ancestral to contemporary populations in the area, but also likely experienced gene flow from Europe. The grand tribal identities of Berber antiquity were said to be three, the Mori, the Numidians near Carthage, and the Gaecha lions. The Mori inhabited the far west. The Numidians were located in the regions between the Mori and the city-state of Carthage. Both the Numidians and the Mori had significant sedentary populations living in villages, and their peoples both tilled the land and tended herds. The Gaecha lions were less settled, with predominantly pastoral elements, and lived in the near south on the margins of the Sahara. For their part, the Phoenicians came from the perhaps most advanced multicultural sphere then existing, the Fertile Crescent. Accordingly, the material culture of Phoenicia was likely more functional and efficient, and their knowledge more explanatory, than that of the early Berbers. Hence, the interactions between Berbers and Phoenicians were often asymmetrical. The Phoenicians worked to keep their cultural cohesion and ethnic solidarity, and continuously refreshed their close connection with Tyre, the mother city. The earliest Phoenician landing stations located on the coasts were probably meant merely to resupply and service ships bound for the lucrative metals trade with the Iberian Peninsula. Perhaps these newly arrived sea traders were not at first particularly interested in doing much business with the Berbers, 
for reason of the little profit regarding the goods the Berbers had to offer. The Phoenicians established strategic colonial cities in many Berber areas, including sites outside of present-day Tunisia, e.g., the settlements at Volubilis, Shala, and Mogadar. As in Tunisia these centers were trading hubs, and later offered support for resource development such as olive oil at Volubilis and Tyrian purple dye at Mogadar. For their part, most Berbers maintained their independence as farmers or semi-pastorals although, due to the exemplar of Carthage, their organized politics increased in scope and acquired sophistication. In fact for a time their numerical and military superiority enabled some Berber kingdoms to impose a tribute payable by Carthage, a condition that continued into the 5th century BC. Also, Due to the berber libyan Meshwish dynasty's rule of Egypt, the Berbers near Carthage commanded significant respect. Correspondingly, in early Carthage careful attention was given to securing the most favorable treaties with the Berber chieftains, which included intermarriage between them and the Punic aristocracy. In this regard, perhaps the legend about Dido, the foundress of Carthage, as related by Trogus is apposite. Her refusal to wed the Mauritani chieftain Hiarbus might be indicative of the complexity of the politics involved. Islamic Conquest Eventually the Phoenician trading stations would evolve into permanent settlements, and later into small towns, which would presumably require a wide variety of goods as well as sources of food which could be satisfied in trade with the Berbers. Yet here too, the Phoenicians probably would be drawn into organizing and directing such local trade, and also into managing agricultural production. In the 5th century BC, Carthage expanded its territory, acquiring Cape Bon and the fertile Wadi Majarta later establishing its control over productive farmlands within several hundred kilometers. Appropriation of such wealth in land by the Phoenicians would surely inspire some resistance by the Berbers, although in warfare, too, the technical training, social organization and weaponry of the Phoenicians would seem to work against the tribal Berbers. This social-cultural interaction in early Carthage has been summarily described. In Al-Andalus under the Umayyad governors Lack of contemporary written records make the drawing of conclusions here uncertain, which can only be based on inference and reasonable conjecture about matters of social nuance. Yet it appears that the Phoenicians generally did not interact with the Berbers as economic equals, but employed their agricultural labor, and their household services, whether by hire or indenture, many became sharecroppers. For a period the Berbers were in constant revolt. In 396 there was a great uprising. Thousands of rebels streamed down from the mountains and invaded Punic territory, carrying the serfs of the countryside along with them. The Carthaginians were obliged to withdraw within their walls and were besieged. Yet the Berbers lacked cohesion, and although 200,000 strong at one point they succumbed to hunger, their leaders were offered bribes, they gradually broke up and returned to their homes. Thereafter, a series of revolts took place among the Libyans from the 4th century onwards. Couscous a semolina staple dish, tagine, a stew made in various forms, pastilla, a meat pie traditionally made with squab often today using chicken, bread made with traditional yeast, bauchiar, burjaj, bakrar, tarakt. These organ meats are rolled up with the intestines on an oak stick and cooked on embers in specially designed ovens. The meat is coated with butter to make it even tastier. This dish is served mainly at festivities. The Berbers had become involuntary hosts to the settlers from the east, 
and obliged to accept the Punic dominance of Carthage for many centuries. The Berbers belonged to the lower social class when in Punic society. Nonetheless, therein they persisted largely unassimilated, as a separate, submerged entity, as a culture of mostly passive urban and rural poor within the civil structures created by Punic rule. In addition, and most importantly, the Berber peoples also formed quasi-independent satellite societies along the steppes of the frontier and beyond, where a minority continued as free tribal republics. While benefiting from Punic material culture and political military institutions, these peripheral Berbers maintained their own identity, culture, and traditions, continued to develop their own agricultural and village skills, while living with the newcomers from the East in an asymmetric symbiosis. As the centuries passed there naturally grew a Punic society of Phoenician descent but born in Africa, called Libby Phoenicians. This term later came to be applied also to Berbers acculturated to urban Phoenician culture. Yet the whole notion of a Berber apprenticeship to the Punic civilization has been called an exaggeration sustained by a point of view fundamentally foreign to the Berbers. There evolved a population of mixed ancestry, Berber, and Punic. There would develop recognized niches in which Berbers had proven their utility. For example, the Punic state began to field Berber Numidian cavalry under their commanders on a regular basis. The Berbers eventually were required to provide soldiers, which by the 4th century BC became the largest single element in the Carthaginian army. Yet in times of stress at Carthage, when a foreign force might be pushing against the city-state, some Berbers would see it as an opportunity to advance their interests, given their otherwise low status in Punic society. Thus, when the Greeks under Agathocles of Sicily landed at Cape Bon and threatened Carthage, there were Berbers under Elymas who went over to the invading Greeks. Also, during the long Second Punic War with Rome, the Berber king Macenissa joined with the invading Roman general Scipio, resulting to the war-ending defeat of Carthage at Zama, despite the presence of their renowned general Hannibal. On the other hand, the Berber king Syphax had supported Carthage. The Romans too read these cues, so that they cultivated their Berber alliances and, subsequently, favoured the Berbers who advanced their interests following the Roman victory. In Al-Andalus during the Umayyad Emirate In Al-Andalus during the Umayyad Caliphate In Al-Andalus in the Tayfa period In Al-Andalus under the Almoravids Carthage was faulted by her ancient rivals for the harsh treatment of her subjects as well as for greed and cruelty. Her Libyan Berber sharecroppers, for example, were required to pay one half of their crops as tribute to the city-state during the emergency of the First Punic War. The normal exaction taken by Carthage was likely an extremely burdensome one quarter. Carthage once famously attempted to short its Libyan and foreign soldiers, leading to the mercenary revolt. Also the city-state seemed to reward those leaders known to deal ruthlessly with its subject peoples. Hence the frequent Berber insurrections. Moderns fault Carthage for failure to bind her subjects to herself, as Rome did her Italians. Yet Rome and the Italians held far more in common perhaps than did Carthage and the Berbers. Nonetheless, a modern criticism tells us that the Carthaginians did themselves a disservice by failing to promote the common, shared quality of life in a properly organized city that inspires loyalty, particularly with regard to the Berbers. Again, the tribute demanded by Carthage was onerous. The Punic relationship with the majority Berbers continued throughout the life of Carthage. 
the unequal development of material culture and social organization perhaps fated the relationship to be an uneasy one. A long-term cause of Punic instability, there was no melding of the peoples. It remained a source of stress and a point of weakness for Carthage. Yet there were degrees of convergence on several particulars, discoveries of mutual advantage, occasions of friendship, and family. The Berbers enter historicity gradually during the Roman era. Byzantine authors mention the Mazakes as tribal people raiding the monasteries of Cyrenaica. Garamantia was a notable Berber kingdom that flourished in the Fezzan area of modern-day Libya, in the Sahara Desert, between 400 BC and 600 AD. Roman-era Cyrenaica became a center of early Christianity. Some pre-Islamic Berbers were Christians, some perhaps Jewish, and some adhered to their traditional polytheist religion. The Roman-era authors Apuleius and St. Augustine were born in the Roman province of Africa, claims that they had Berber ancestry are unproven. As is true of three popes from the province, Pope Victor I served during the reign of Roman Emperor Septimius Severus, who was a North African of Roman-slash-Punic ancestry. Numidia was an ancient Berber kingdom in modern Algeria and part of Tunisia. It later alternated between being a Roman province and being a Roman client state. The polity was located on the eastern border of modern Algeria, bordered by the Roman province of Mauritania to the west, the Roman province of Africa to the east, the Mediterranean to the north, and the Sahara Desert to the south. Its people were the Numidians. The name Numidia was first applied by Polybius and other historians during the 3rd century BC to indicate the territory west of Carthage, including the entire north of Algeria as far as the river Mulicha, about 160 kilometers west of Oran. The Numidians were conceived of as two great groups, the Massilii in eastern Numidia, and the Masizili in the west. During the first part of the Second Punic War, the eastern Masilii under their king Gala were allied with Carthage, while the western Masizili under King Syphax were allied with Rome. In 206 BC, the new king of the eastern Masilii, Masinissa, allied himself with Rome and Syphax of the Masizili switched his allegiance to the Carthaginian side. At the end of the war, the victorious Romans gave all of Numidia to Masinissa of the Masilii. At the time of his death in 148 BC, Masinissa's territory extended from Mauritania to the boundary of the Carthaginian territory, and also southeast as far as Cyrenaica so that Numidia entirely surrounded Carthage except towards the sea. Modern History Masinissa was succeeded by his son Masipsa. When Masipsa died in 118 BC, he was succeeded jointly by his two sons Hyampsali and Adherbal and Masinissa's illegitimate grandson, Jugurtha, of Berber origin, who was very popular among the Numidians. Hyampsal and Jugurtha quarreled immediately after the death of Masipsa. Jugurtha had Hyampsal killed, which led to open war with Adherbal. After Jugurtha defeated him in open battle, Adherbal fled to Rome for help. The Roman officials, allegedly due to bribes but perhaps more likely because of a desire to quickly end conflict in a profitable client kingdom, settled the fight by dividing Numidia into two parts. Jugurtha was assigned the western half. However, soon after conflict broke out again, leading to the Jugurtine War between Rome and Numidia. In antiquity, Mauritania was an ancient Mauri Berber kingdom in modern Morocco and part of Algeria. It became a client state of the Roman Empire in 33 BC 
then a full Roman province after the death of its last king Ptolemy of Mauritania in AD, a member of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Contemporary Demographics Diaspora Languages Before the 11th century, most of northwest Africa was a Berber-speaking Muslim area. The process of Arabization only became a major factor with the arrival of the Banu Hilal, a tribe sent by the Fatimids of Egypt to punish the Berber Zirid dynasty for having abandoned Shiism. The Banu Hilal reduced the Zirids to a few coastal towns and took over much of the plains, their influx was a major factor in the Arabization of the region and in the spread of nomadism in areas where agriculture had previously been dominant. After the Muslim conquest, the Berber tribes of coastal North Africa became almost fully Islamized. Besides the Arabian influence, North African population also saw an influx via the Barbary slave trade of European peoples, with some estimates placing the number of European slaves brought to North Africa during the Ottoman period as high as 1.25 million. Interactions with neighboring Sudanic empires, traders, and nomads from other parts of Africa also left impressions upon the Berber people. According to historians of the Middle Ages, the Berbers were divided into two branches, Bajr and Barnes, descended from Mazai ancestors, who were themselves divided into tribes and sub-tribes. Each region of the Maghreb contained several tribes. All these tribes had independence and territorial hegemony. Several Berber dynasties emerged during the Middle Ages in the Maghreb and Al-Andalus. The most notable are the Zirids, the Hamadids, the Almoravid dynasty, the Almohads, the Hafsids, the Zionids, the Marinids, and the Wada Sids. They belong to a powerful, formidable, brave, and numerous people, a true people like so many others the world has seen, like the Arabs, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. The men who belong to this family of peoples have inhabited the Maghreb since the beginning. Groups Unlike the conquests of previous religions and cultures, the coming of Islam, which was spread by Arabs, was to have extensive and long-lasting effects on the Maghrib. The new faith, in its various forms, would penetrate nearly all segments of Berber society, bringing with it armies, learned men, and fervent mystics, and in large part replacing tribal practices and loyalties with new social norms and political idioms. Nonetheless, the Islamization and Arabization of the region was a complicated and lengthy process. Whereas nomadic Berbers were quick to convert and assist the Arab conquerors, it was not until the 12th century, under the Almohad dynasty, that the Christian, Jewish, and animist communities of the Maghreb became marginalized. Jews persisted within northern Africa as Jehimis, protected peoples, under Islamic law. They continued to occupy prominent economic and political roles within the Maghreb. Indeed, some scholars believe that Jewish merchants may have crossed the Sahara, although others dispute this claim. Indigenous Christian communities within the Maghreb all but disappeared under Islamic rule, although Christian communities from Europe may still be found in the Maghreb to this day. The first Arabian military expeditions into the Maghreb, between 642 and 669, resulted in the spread of Islam. These early forays from a base in Egypt occurred under local initiative rather than under orders from the central caliphate. But when the seat of the caliphate moved from Medina to Damascus, the Umayyads recognized that the strategic necessity of dominating the Mediterranean dictated a concerted military effort on the North African front. In 670, therefore, 
an Arab army under Uqba ibn Nafi established the town of Kairawan about 160 km south of modern Tunis and used it as a base for further operations. Abu al-Muhajir Dinar, Uqba's successor, pushed westward into Algeria and eventually worked out a modus vivendi with Qusayla, the ruler of an extensive confederation of Christian Berbers. Qusayla, who had been based in Tlemcen, became a Muslim and moved his headquarters to Takarwan, near al Kairawan. This harmony was short-lived, Arabian and Berber forces controlled the region in turn until 697. By 711, Umayyad forces helped by Berber converts to Islam had conquered all of North Africa. Governors appointed by the Umayyad caliphs ruled from Kerwa, capital of the new Wilaya of Afriqiya, which covered Tripolitania, Tunisia, and eastern Algeria. The spread of Islam among the Berbers did not guarantee their support for the Arab-dominated caliphate due to the discriminatory attitude of the Arabs. The ruling Arabs alienated the Berbers by taxing them heavily, treating converts as second-class Muslims, and, worst of all, by enslaving them. As a result, widespread opposition took the form of open revolt in 739-40 under the banner of Ibadan Islam. The Ibadan had been fighting Umayyad rule in the east and many Berbers were attracted by the sect's seemingly egalitarian precepts. After the revolt, Ibadan established a number of theocratic tribal kingdoms, most of which had short and troubled histories. But others, like Sigil Mesa and Tlemcen, which straddled the principal trade routes, proved more viable and prospered. In 750, the Abbasids, who succeeded the Umayyads as Muslim rulers, moved the caliphate to Baghdad and re-established caliphal authority in Afriqiya, appointing Ibrahim ibn al-Aklab as governor in Kerwa. Though nominally serving at the caliph's pleasure, al-Aklab and his successors, the Aklabids, ruled independently until 909, presiding over a court that became a center for learning and culture. Just to the west of Aklabid lands, Abdar Rahman ibn Rustam ruled most of the central Maghreb from Tahirt, southwest of Algiers. The rulers of the Rustamid Imamate, each an Ibadi Imam, were elected by leading citizens. The Imams gained a reputation for honesty, piety, and justice. The court at Tahirt was noted for its support of scholarship in mathematics, astronomy, astrology, theology, and law. The Rustamid imams failed, by choice or by neglect, to organize a reliable standing army. This important factor, accompanied by the dynasty's eventual collapse into decadence, opened the way for Tahirt's demise under the assault of the Fatimids. The Muslim Mahdiya was founded by the Fatimids under the Caliph Abdallah al-Mahdi in 921 and made the capital city of Afriqiya, by Caliph Abdallah al-Fatimai. It was chosen as the capital because of its proximity to the sea, and the promontory on which an important military settlement had been since the time of the Phoenicians. The Fatimids established the Tunisian city of Mahdiya and made it their capital city, before conquering Egypt, and building the city of Cairo in 969. The Muslims who invaded the Iberian Peninsula in 711 were mainly Berbers, and were led by a Berber, Tariq ibn Ziad, though under the suzerainty of the Arab Caliph of Damascus Abd al-Malik ibn Marwan and his North African Viceroy, Musa ibn Nasair. Due to subsequent antagonism between Arabs and Berbers, and to the fact that most of the histories of al-Andalus were written from an Arab perspective, the Berber role is understated in the available sources.
The Biographical Dictionary of IBN Kalakan preserves the record of the Berber predominance in the invasion of 711, in the entry on Tariq IBN Ziad. A second mixed army of Arabs and Berbers came in 712 under IBN Nasser himself. They supposedly helped the Umayyad Caliph Abdar Rahman I in Al Andalus, because his mother was a Berber. Religion Notable Berbers Roger Collins suggests that if the forces that invaded the Iberian Peninsula were predominantly Berber, it is because there were insufficient Arab forces in Africa to maintain control of Africa and attack Iberia at the same time. Thus, although North Africa had only been conquered about a dozen years previously, the Arabs already employed forces of the defeated Berbers to carry out their next invasion. This would explain the predominance of Berbers over Arabs in the initial invasion. In addition, Collins argues that Berber social organization made it possible for the Arabs to recruit entire tribal units into their armies, making the defeated Berbers excellent military auxiliaries. The Berber forces in the invasion of Iberia came from Afriqiya or as far away as Tripolitania. Governor as Samite distributed land to the conquering forces, apparently by tribe, though it is difficult to determine from the few historical sources available. It was at this time that the positions of Arabs and Berbers was regularized across the Iberian Peninsula. Berbers were positioned in many of the most mountainous regions of Spain, such as the mountains of Granada, the Pyrenees, and the mountains of Cantabria and Galicia. Roger Collins suggests this may be because some Berbers were familiar with mountain terrain, whereas the Arabs were not. By the late 710s, there was a Berber governor in Leon or Hihon. When Pelagius revolted in Asturias, it was against a Berber governor. This revolt challenged Asamita's plans to settle Berbers in the Galician and Cantabrian mountains, and by the middle of the 8th century it seems there was no more Berber presence in Galicia. The expulsion of the Berber garrisons from central Asturias following the Battle of Covadonga contributed to the eventual formation of the independent Asturian Kingdom. In Christian History Many Berbers were settled in what were then the frontier lands near Toledo, Talavera, and Merida. Merida became a major Berber stronghold in the 8th century. The Berber garrison in Talavera would later be commanded by Amrus Ibn Yusuf and involved in military operations against rebels in Toledo in the late 700s and early 800s. Berbers were also initially settled in the eastern Pyrenees and Catalonia. Berbers were not settled in the major cities of the south, and were generally kept in the frontier zones away from Cordoba. In Islamic History Architecture Culture Cuisine Music Notes Roger Collins cites the work of Pierre Guichard to argue that Berber groups in Iberia retained their own distinctive social organization. According to this traditional view of Arab and Berber culture in the Iberian Peninsula, Berber society was highly impermeable to outside influences, whereas Arabs became assimilated and Hispanized. Some support for the view that Berbers assimilated less comes from an excavation of an Islamic cemetery in northern Spain, which reveals that the Berbers accompanying the initial invasion brought their families with them from North Africa. In 731, the eastern Pyrenees were under the control of Berber forces garrisoned in the major towns under the command of Manuza. Manuza attempted to lead a Berber uprising against the Arabs in Spain, citing mistreatment of Berbers by Arabic judges in North Africa. Manuza made an alliance with Duke Yudo of Aquitaine. However, Governor Abdar Rahman attacked Manuza before he was ready, 
and besieging him, defeated him at Sardinia. Because of the alliance with Manusa, Abdar Rahman wanted to punish Udo, and his punitive expedition ended in the Arab defeat at Poitiers. By the time of the governor Ukba, and possibly as early as 714, the city of Pamplona was occupied by a Berber garrison. An 8th century cemetery has been discovered with 190 burials all according to Islamic custom, testifying to the presence of this garrison. In 798, however, Pamplona is recorded as being under a Banu Qasi governor, Mutarif Ibn Musa. Ibn Musa lost control of Pamplona to a popular uprising. In 806 Pamplona gave allegiance to the Franks, and in 824 became an independent kingdom of Pamplona. These events put an end to the Berber garrison in Pamplona. Al-Hakam wrote that there was a major Berber revolt in North Africa in 740-741, led by Masera. The Chronicle of 754 calls these rebels Arruers, which Collins translates as heretics, arguing it is a reference to the Berber rebels Abadi or Karaji sympathies. After Charles Martel attacked Arab ally Morontis at Marseille in 739, Governor Akba planned a punitive attack against the Franks, but news of a Berber revolt in North Africa made him turn back when he reached Zaragoza. Instead, according to the Chronicle of 754, Akba carried out an attack against Berber fortresses in Africa. Initially these attacks were unsuccessful, but then Akba destroyed the rebels, secured all the crossing points to Spain, and then returned to his governorship. Although Masera was killed by his own followers, the revolt spread and the Berber rebels defeated three Arab armies. After the defeat of the Third Army, which included elite units of Syrians commanded by Kultham and Balje, the Berber revolt spread further. At this time, the Berber military colonies in Spain revolted. At the same time, Akba died and was replaced by Ibn Qutun. By this time, the Berbers controlled most of the north of the Iberian Peninsula, except for the Ebro Valley, and were menacing Toledo. Ibn Qutun invited Balje and his Syrian troops, who were at that time in Ceuta, to cross to the Iberian Peninsula to fight against the Berbers. The Berbers marched south in three columns, simultaneously attacking Toledo, Cordoba, and the ports on the Gibraltar Straits. However, Ibn Qutun's sons defeated the army of Toledo, the governor's forces defeated the attack on Cordoba, and Balje defeated the attack on the Straits. After this, Balje seized power by marching on Cordoba and executing Ibn Qutun. Collins points out that Balje's troops were away from Syria just when the Abbasid revolt against the Umayyads broke out, and this may have contributed to the fall of the Umayyad regime. In Africa, the Berbers acted under divided leadership. Their attack on Kerwa was defeated and a new governor of Africa, Hansala Ibn Safwan, proceeded to defeat the rebels in Africa and then to impose peace between Balje's troops and the existing Andalusi Arabs. Roger Collins argues that the Great Berber Revolt facilitated the establishment of the Kingdom of Asturias and altered the demographics of the Berber population in the Iberian Peninsula specifically contributing to the Berber departure from the northwest of the peninsula. When the Arabs first invaded the peninsula, Berber groups were situated in the northwest. However, due to the Berber revolt the Umayyad governors were forced to protect their southern flank and were unable to mount offences against the Asturians. Some presence of Berbers in the northwest may have been maintained at first 
but after the 740s there is no more mention of the northwestern Berbers in the sources. When the Umayyad dynasty was overthrown in 750, a grandson of Caliph Hisham, Abdar Rahman, escaped to North Africa. Abdar Rahman hid among the Berbers of North Africa for five years. A persistent tradition states that this is because his mother was Berber. Abdar Rahman first took refuge with the Nafsa Berbers, his mother's people. As the governor Ibn Habib was looking for him, he then fled to the more powerful Zanata Berber Confederacy, who were enemies of Ibn Habib. Since the Zanata had been part of the initial invasion force of Al-Andalus, and were still present in the Iberian Peninsula, this gave Abdar Rahman a base of support in Al-Andalus. However, Abdar Rahman seems to have drawn most of his support from portions of Baljay's army that were still loyal to the Umayyads. After Abdar Rahman crossed to Spain in 756, he declared himself the legitimate Umayyad ruler of Al-Andalus. The governor, Yusuf, refused to submit. After losing an initial battle near Córdoba, Yusuf fled to Merida, where he raised a large Berber army. With this army, Yusuf marched on Seville, but was defeated by forces loyal to Abdar Rahman. Yusuf fled to Toledo, and was either killed on the way, or after reaching Toledo. However, Yusuf's cousin Hisham Ibn Urway continued to resist Abdar Rahman from Toledo until 764 and the sons of Yusuf revolted again in 785. All these family members of Yusuf, members of the Firi tribe, were very effective at obtaining support from Berbers in their revolts against the Umayyad regime. As Emir of Al-Andalus, Abdar Rahman I faced persistent opposition from Berber groups, including the Zanata. Berbers provided much of Yusuf's support in fighting against Abdar Rahman. In 774 Zanata Berbers were involved in a Yemeni revolt in the area of Seville. Andalusi Berber Salih Ibn Taraf declared himself a prophet and ruled the Bargawada in Morocco in the 770s. In 768, a Manasa Berber named Sheikhya Ibn Abd al Walid declared himself a Fatimid Imam, claiming descent from Fatima and Ali. He is mainly known from the work of Ibn al Athir. According to Ibn al Athir, Sheikh's revolt originated in the area of modern Cuenca, an area of Spain that is highly mountainous and challenging to traverse. Sheikh first killed the Umayyad governor of the fortress of Santa Ver, and subsequently ravaged the surrounding district of Coria. Abdar Rahman sent out armies to fight him in 769, 770 and 771, but Sheikhya avoided them by moving into the mountains. In 772, Sheikhya defeated an Umayyad force and killed the governor of the fortress of Medellin by a ruse. He was besieged by Umayyads in 774, but the revolt near Seville forced the besieging troops to withdraw. In 775 a Berber garrison in Coria declared allegiance to Sheikhya, but Abdar Rahman retook the town and chased the Berbers into the mountains. In 776 Sheikhya resisted sieges to his two main fortresses at Santaver and Shabatran. In 777 Sheikhya was betrayed and killed by his own followers, who sent his head to Abdar Rahman. Roger Collins notes that both modern historians and ancient Arab authors have had a tendency to portray Sheikhya as a fanatic followed by credulous fanatics, and to argue that he was either self-deluded or fraudulent in his claim of Fatimid descent. However, 
Collins considers him an example of the messianic leaders that were not uncommon among Berbers at that time and earlier. He compares Sheikha to Idris I, a descendant of Ali accepted by the Zanata Berbers, who founded the Idrisid dynasty in 788, and to Sulahi bn Tarif, who ruled the Bargawada Berber in the 770s. He also compares these leaders to pre-Islamic leaders Kahina and Kozela. In 788, Hisham succeeded Abdar Rahman as emir, but his brother Suleiman revolted. Suleiman fled to the Berber garrison of Valencia, where he held out for two years. Finally he came to terms with Hisham and went into exile in 790, together with other brothers of his who had rebelled with him. In North Africa, Suleiman and his brothers forged alliances with local Berbers, especially the Karajite ruler of Tahirt. After the death of Hishami and the accession of Al-Hakam, the brothers challenged Al-Hakam for the succession. Abd Allah crossed over to Valencia first in 796, calling on the allegiance of the same Berber garrison that sheltered Suleiman years earlier. Crossing to Al-Andalus in 798, Suleiman based himself in Elvira, Isija, and Jain, apparently drawing support from the Berbers in these mountainous southern regions. Suleiman was defeated in battle in 800 and fled to the Berber stronghold in Merida, but was captured before reaching it and executed in Cordoba. In 797, the Berbers of Talavera played a major part in defeating a revolt against al hakam I in Toledo. A Sirain Ubaid al ibn Hamir rebelled in Toledo against al hakam al hakam ordered Amrus ibn Yusuf to destroy the rebellion. Amrus was the commander of the Berbers in Talavera. Amrus negotiated in secret with the Banu Masa faction in Toledo promising them the governorship if they betrayed Ibn Hamir. The Banu Masa brought Ibn Hamir's head to Amrus in Talavera. However, there was a feud between the Banu Masa and the Berbers of Talavera. The Berbers of Talavera killed all the Banu Masa. Amrus sent the heads of the Banu Masa along with that of Ibn Hamir to Al-Hakam in Cordoba. The Toledo rebellion was sufficiently weakened that Amrus was able to enter Toledo and convince its inhabitants to submit. Roger Collins argues that unassimilated Berber garrisons in Al-Andalus engaged in local vendettas and feuds, such as the conflict with the Banu Masa. This was due to the limited power of the Umayyad Amir's central authority. Collins states that the Berbers, despite being fellow Muslims, were despised by those who claimed Arab descent. As well as having feuds with Arab factions, the Berbers sometimes had major conflicts with the local communities where they were stationed. In 794, the Berber garrison of Tarragona massacred the inhabitants of the city. Tarragona was uninhabited for seven years until the Frankish conquest of Barcelona led to its reoccupation. In 829, one of the leaders of the Toledo Rebellion of 797, Hashim al-Darab, who had been kept under arrest in Córdoba, escaped, returned to Toledo, and started another rebellion. From Toledo, Hashim attacked the Berber garrisons of Santaver and Talavera, precisely those that had been involved in suppressing the Toledo Rebellion a generation earlier. Hashim gained control of Calatrava La Vieja, then a major fortress town, until 834. Hashim was killed in battle in 831, but his followers maintained the rebellion and Berbers from Calatrava besieged Toledo in 835 and 836. The rebellion was finally ended in 837, when the emir's brother al-Walid became governor of Toledo. 
Throughout the 9th century, the Berber garrisons were one of the main military supports of the Umayyad regime. Although they had caused numerous problems for Abdar Rahman I, Collins suggests that by the reign of al Hakam, the Berber conflicts with Arabs and native Iberians meant that Berbers could only look to the Umayyad regime for support and patronage, developing solid ties of loyalty to the emirs. However, they were also difficult to control, and by the end of the 9th century the Berber frontier garrisons disappear from the sources. Collins says this might be because they migrated back to North Africa or gradually assimilated. A Berber leader named H. Aviva led a rebellion around Algeciras in 850. Little is known of this rebellion other than its occurrence, and that it may have had a religious inspiration. Berber groups were involved in the rebellion of Umar ibn Hafsun from 880 to 915. Ibn Hafsun rebelled in 880, was captured then escaped in 883 to his base in Bobastro. There he formed an alliance with the Banu Rifa tribe of Berbers, who had a stronghold in al Hama. He then formed alliances with other local Berber clans, taking the towns of Osuna, Estepa, and Isija in 889. He captured Jain in 892. He was only defeated in 915 by Abdar Rahman III. New waves of Berber settlers arrived in Al Andalus in the 10th century, brought in as mercenaries by Abdar Rahman III to help him in his campaigns to recover Umayyad authority in areas that had thrown off allegiance to the Umayyads during the reigns of the previous emirs. These new Berbers lacked any familiarity with the pattern of relationships that had existed in Al-Andalus in the 700s and 800s, thus they were not involved in the same web of traditional conflicts and loyalties as the existing Berber garrisons. New frontier settlements were built for the Berber mercenaries who arrived in the 900s. Written sources state that some of Abdar Rahman's new Berber mercenaries were placed in Calatrava, which was refortified. Another Berber settlement called Vascos, west of Toledo, is not mentioned in the historical sources, but has been excavated archaeologically. It was a fortified town, had walls, and a separate fortress or Alcazar. Two cemeteries have been discovered also. It was established in the 900s as a frontier town for Berbers, probably of the Nafza tribe. It was abandoned soon after the Castilian occupation of Toledo in 1085. The Berber inhabitants took all their possessions with them. In the 900s, the Umayyad Caliphate faced a challenge from the Fatimids in North Africa. The Fatimid Caliphate was founded by Ubaid Allah al Mahdi Billah after his disciples gained a large following among the Qutama Berbers in what is today eastern Algeria and western Tunisia. After taking the city of Kerwa and overthrowing the Aklabids in 909, the Mahdi Ubaid Allah declared himself Caliph which represented a direct challenge to the Umayyads' own claim to the caliphate. The Fatimids gained overlordship over the Idrisids, then launched a conquest of the Maghrib. To counter the threat, the Umayyads crossed the straits to take over Sayuda in 931, and actively formed alliances with Berber confederacies such as the Zanata and the Araba. Rather than fighting each other directly, the competition of Fatimids and Umayyads played out as a competition for Berber allegiances. In turn, this provided a motivation for the further Islamic conversion of Berbers, many of whom, particularly farther south away from the Mediterranean, were still Christian and pagan. In turn, this would contribute to the development of all Moravids and all Mohads which would have a major impact on Al-Andalus and contribute to the end of the Umayyad Caliphate. 
with the help of his new mercenary forces, which were mainly composed of recent Berber arrivals, Abdar Rahman launched a series of attacks on parts of the Iberian Peninsula that had fallen away from Umayyad allegiance. In the 920s he campaigned against the areas that rebelled under Umar Ibn Hafsun and still refused to submit. These he submitted in the 920s. He conquered Merida in 928-929. Sayuda in 931, and Toledo in 932. In 934 Abdar Rahman III began a campaign in the north against Ramiro II of Leon and Muhammad ibn Hashim al-Tujabai, the governor of Zaragoza. According to ibn Hayyan, after inconclusively confronting al-Tujabai on the Ebro, Abdar Rahman briefly forced the kingdom of Pamplona into submission, ravaged Castile and Alava, and met Ramiro II in an inconclusive battle. From 935 to 937, Abdar Rahman confronted the Tujabids, defeating them in 937. In 939 Ramiro II defeated the combined Umayyad and Tujabid armies in the Battle of Simancas. Umayyad influence in western North Africa spread through diplomacy rather than conquest. The Umayyads sought out alliances with various Berber confederacies. These would declare loyalty to the Umayyad Caliphate in opposition to the Fatimids. The Umayyads would send gifts including embroidered silk ceremonial cloaks. During this time, mints in cities on the Moroccan coast occasionally issued coins with the names of Umayyad caliphs, showing the extent of Umayyad diplomatic influence. The text of a letter of friendship from a Berber leader to the Umayyad caliph has been preserved in the work of Isa al-Razi. During the reign of Abdar Rahman three tensions increased between the three distinct components of the Muslim community in Al-Andalus, Berbers, Sakalaba, and those of Arab or mixed Arab and Gothic descent. Following Abdar Rahman's proclamation of the new Umayyad Caliphate in Cordoba, the Umayyads placed a great emphasis on the Umayyad membership of the Quraysh tribe. This led to a fashion in Cordoba for claiming pure Arab ancestry as opposed to descent from freed slaves. Claims of descent from Visigothic noble families also became common. However, an immediately detrimental consequence of this acute consciousness of ancestry was the revival of ethnic disparagement, directed in particular against the Berbers and the Sakalaba. When the Fatimids moved their capital to Egypt in 969, they left North Africa in charge of viceroys from the Zirid clan of Sanyaja Berbers, who were Fatimid loyalists and enemies of the Zanata. The Zirids in turn divided their territories, assigning some to the Hamadid branch of the family to govern. The Hamadids became independent in 1014 with their capital at Kalat Beni Hamad. With the withdrawal of the Fatimids to Egypt, however, the rivalry with the Umayyads decreased. Al-Hakam II sent Muhammad ibn Abi Amir to North Africa in 973-974 to act as Qadi al-Qudat to the Berber groups that had accepted Umayyad authority. Ibn Abi Amir was treasurer of the household of the caliph's wife and children, director of the mint at Madinat al-Zara, commander of the Cordoba police, and Qadi of the frontier. During his time as Qadi in North Africa, Ibn Abi Amir developed close ties with the North African Berbers. On the death of al-Hakam II, the heir Hisham II was underage and the position of Hajib was occupied by a Berber named Al-Mushayfi. However, General Galib and Muhammad ibn Abi Amir formed an alliance, 
and in 978 they overthrew al mushafi and his sons and other family members, who had received offices. al mushafi was imprisoned for five years before being killed, and his family was stripped of property and titles. In 980, Ibn Abi Amir fell out with his ally Galib, and a civil war began. Ibn Abi Amir called on the Berbers he had lived with in 973 to 974 to come help him. His Berber ally Jafar Ibn Hamdun crossed the straits with his army, whereas Galib allied with the Kingdom of Navarre. These armies fought several battles in the last one of which Galad was killed, bringing the civil war to an end. Ibn Abi Amir then took on the name Al-Mansur, the Victorious, by which he is more commonly known. Having won the war, Al-Mansur no longer needed his Berber ally Ibn Hamdun, who instead became a threat due to his substantial army. Ibn Hamdun was murdered in 983 having been made drunk at a feast held in his honor, then murdered as he departed. According to Ibn it Harry, his head and one hand were then presented in secret to Al-Mansur. Employing large numbers of Berber and Sakalaba mercenaries, Al-Mansur initiated a series of highly successful attacks on the Christian portions of the peninsula. Among the most memorable campaigns were the sack of Barcelona in 985, the destruction of Leon in 988, the capture of Count Garcia Fernandez of Castile in 995, and the sack of Santiago in 997. Almanzar died in 1002. He was succeeded as Hajib by his son, Abd al-Malik. In 1008, Abd al-Malik died and was succeeded as Hajib by his half-brother, Abd ar Rahman, known as Sancha Uolo because his mother was Navarreset. Meanwhile, Hisham II remained caliph, though this had become a ceremonial position. Considerable resentment arose in Cordoba against the increasing numbers of Berbers brought from North Africa by Al-Mansur and his children Abd al-Malik and Sancha Uolo. It was said that Sancha Uolo ordered anyone attending his court to wear Berber turbans, which Roger Collins suggests may not have been true, but shows that hostile anti-Berber propaganda was being used to discredit the sons of Al-Mansur. In 1009, Sancha Uolo had himself proclaimed Hisham II's successor, and then went on military campaign. However, while he was away a revolt took place. Sancha Uolo's palace was sacked and his support fell away. As he marched back to Cordoba his own Berber mercenaries abandoned him. Knowing the strength of ill-feeling against them in Cordoba, they thought Sancha Uolo would be unable to protect them and so they went elsewhere in order to survive and secure their own interests. Sancha Uolo was left with only a few followers, and was captured and killed in 1009. Hisham II abdicated and was replaced by Muhammad II al-Mahdi. Having abandoned Sancha Uolo, the Berbers who had formed his army turned to another ambitious Umayyad, Suleiman, whom they supported. They obtained logistical support from Count Sancho Garcia of Castile. Marching on Cordoba, they defeated Sakalaba General Wadi and forced Muhammad II al-Mahdi to flee to Toledo. They then installed Suleiman as caliph, and based themselves in the Madinat al-Zara to avoid friction with the local population. Wadi and al-Mahdi formed an alliance with the counts of Barcelona and Urgel and marched back on Córdoba. They defeated Suleiman and the Berber forces in a battle near Córdoba in 1010. To avoid being destroyed, the Berbers left Córdoba and fled towards Algeciras. Al-Mahdi swore to exterminate the Berbers, and pursued them. However, 
he was defeated in battle near Marbella. With Wadi, he fled back to Cordoba while his Catalan allies went home. The Berbers turned around and besieged Cordoba. Deciding that he was about to lose, Wadi overthrew Almadi and sent his head to the Berbers, replacing him with Hisham too. However, the Berbers did not end the siege. They methodically destroyed Cordoba's suburbs, pinning the inhabitants inside the old Roman walls and destroying the Madinat Alzara. Wadia's allies killed him, and the Cordoba garrison surrendered with the expectation of amnesty. However, a massacre ensued in which the Berbers took revenge for many personal and collective injuries and permanently settled several feuds in the process. The Berbers made Suleiman Caliph once again. Ibn Idhari said that the installation of Suleiman in 1013 was the moment when the rule of the Berbers began in Cordoba and that of the Umayyads ended, after it had existed for 268 years and 43 days. During the Taifa era, the petty kings came from a variety of ethnic groups, some for instance the Zirid kings of Granada were of Berber origin. The Taifa period ended when a Berber dynasty the Moroccan Almoravids took over Al-Andalus, they were succeeded by the Almohad dynasty of Morocco, during which time Al-Andalus flourished. After the fall of Cordoba in 1013, the Sakalaba fled from the city to secure their own fiefdoms. One group of Sakalaba seized Orihuela from its Berber garrison and took control of its entire region. Among the Berbers who were brought to Al-Andalus by Al-Mansur were the Zirid family of Sanyaja Berbers. After the fall of Cordoba, the Zirids took over Granada in 1013, forming the Zirid Kingdom of Granada. The Sakalaba Karan, with his own Umayyad figurehead Abdar Rahman for al murtada attempted to seize Granada from the Zirids in 1018 but failed. Karin then executed Abdar Rahman IV. Karin's son, Zuhair, also made war on the Zirid kingdom of Granada, but was killed in 1038. In Cordoba, Conflicts continued between the Berber rulers and those of the citizenry who saw themselves as Arab. After being installed as caliph with Berber support, Suleiman was pressured into distributing southern provinces to his Berber allies. The Sanyaja departed from Cordoba at this time. The Zanata Berber Hamudids received the important districts of Ceuta and Algeciras. The Hamudids claimed a family relation to the Idrisids, and thus traced their ancestry to the Caliph Ali. In 1016 they rebelled in Ceuta, claiming to be supporting the restoration of Hisham II. They took control of Malaga, then marched on Cordoba, taking it and executing Suleiman and his family. Ali ibn Hamyud al-Nasir declared himself Caliph a position he held for two years. For some years, Hamudids and Umayyads fought one another and the caliphate passed between them several times. Hamudids also fought among themselves. The last Hamudid caliph reigned until 1027. The Hamudids were then expelled from Cordoba, where there was still a great deal of anti-Berber sentiment. The Hamudids remained in Malaga until expelled by the Zirids in 1056. The Zirids of Granada controlled Malaga until 1073, after which separate Zirid kings retained control over the Taifas of Granada and Malaga until the Almoravid conquest. During the Taifa period, the Aftasid dynasty based in Badajoz controlled a large territory centered on the Guadiana River Valley. The area of Aftasid control was very large, stretching from the Sierra Morena and the Taifas of Mertala and Silves to the south, 
to the Campo de Calatrava in the west and the Montes de Toledo in the northwest and nearly as far as Oporto in the northeast. According to Bernard Riley, during the Tefa period genealogy continued to be an obsession of the upper classes in Al-Andalus. Most wanted to trace their lineage back to the Syrian and Yemeni Arabs who accompanied the invasion. In contrast, tracing descent from the Berbers who came with the same invasion was to be stigmatized as of inferior birth. Riley notes, however, that in practice the two groups had by the 11th century become almost indistinguishable, both groups gradually ceased to be distinguishable parts of the Muslim population, except when one of them actually ruled a Taifa, in which case his origins were well publicized by his rivals. Nevertheless, distinctions between Arab, Berber, and slave were not the stuff of serious politics either within or between the Taifas. It was the individual family that was the unit of political activity. The Berber that arrived towards the end of the Caliphate as mercenary forces, says Riley, amounted to only about 20,000 people in a total Al Andalusi population of 6 million. Their high visibility was due to their foundation of Taifa dynasties rather than large numbers. In the power hierarchy, Berbers were situated between the Arabic aristocracy and the Malady populace. Ethnic rivalry was one of the most important factors driving Andalusi politics. Berbers made up as much as 20% of the population of the occupied territory. After the fall of the Caliphate, the Taifa kingdoms of Toledo, Badajoz, Malaga, and Granada had Berber rulers. During the Reconquista, Berbers in the areas which became Christian kingdoms were acculturated and lost their ethnic identity, their descendants being among modern Spanish and Portuguese peoples. During the Taifa period, the Almoravid Empire developed in northwest Africa. The core of the Almoravid Empire was formed by the Lamtuna branch of the Sanyaja Berber. In the mid-11th century, they allied with the Gudala and Masufa Berber. At that time, the Almoravid leader Yahya ibn Ibrahim went on a hatch. On his way back he met Malikite preachers in Kerwa, and invited them to his land. Malikite disciple Abd Allah ibn Yasin accepted the invitation. Traveling to Morocco, he established a military monastery or ribat where he trained a highly motivated and disciplined fighting force. In 1054 and 1055, employing these specially trained forces, Al Moravid leader Yahya ibn Umar defeated the Kingdom of Ghana and the Zanata Berber. After Yahya ibn Umar died, his brother Abu Bakr ibn Umar pursued the expansion of the Al Moravids. Forced to resolve a Sanyaja civil war, he left control of the Moroccan conquests to his brother, Yusuf ibn Tashafin. Yusuf continued to conquer territory, and following Abu Bakr's death in 1087, Yusuf became the Al Moravid leader. After their loss of Cordoba, the Hamudids had occupied Algeciras and Ceuta. In the mid-11th century, the Hamudids lost control of their Iberian possessions, but retained a small Taifa kingdom based in Ceuta. In 1083, Yusuf ibn Tashafin conquered Ceuta. In the same year, Al-Mutamid, king of the Sevilla Taifa, Traveled to Morocco to appeal to Yusuf for help against King Alfonso VI of Castile. Earlier, in 1079, the King of Badajoz, Al Mutawakal, had appealed to Yusuf for help against Alfonso. After the fall of Toledo to Alfonso VI in 1085, Al Mutamid appealed again to Yusuf. This time, Financed by the Taifa kings of Iberia, 
Yusuf crossed to Al-Andalus, taking direct personal control of Algeciras in 1086. There is an identity-related debate about the persecution of Berbers by the Arab-dominated regimes of North Africa. Through both exclusivities of Pan-Arabism and Islamism, their issue of identity is due to the Pan-Arabist ideology of the former Egyptian president, Gamal Abdel Nasser. Some activists have claimed that it is time long past overdue to confront the racist Arabization of the Amazi lands. Soon after independence in the middle of the 20th century, the countries of North Africa established Arabic as their official language, replacing French, Spanish and Italian, although the shift from European colonial languages to Arabic for official purposes continues even to this day. As a result, most Berbers had to study and know Arabic, and had no opportunities until the 21st century to use their mother tongue at school or university. This may have accelerated the existing process of Arabization of Berbers, especially in already bilingual areas, such as among the Chewis of Algeria. Tamazite is now taught in Auras since the march led by Mr. Salim Yeza in 2004, which has started to the teaching of Tamazite in the schools in Auras. While Berberism had its roots before the independence of these countries, it was limited to the Berber elite. It only began to gain success among the greater populace when North African states replaced their European colonial languages with Arabic and identified exclusively as Arabian nations, downplaying or ignoring the existence and the social specificity of Berbers. However, its distribution remains highly uneven. In response to its demands, Morocco and Algeria have both modified their policies with Algeria redefining itself constitutionally as an Arab, Berber, Muslim nation. Now, Berber is a national language in Algeria and is taught in some Berber-speaking areas as a non-compulsory language. In Morocco, after the constitutional reforms of 2011, Berber has become an official language and is now taught as a compulsory language in all schools regardless of the area or the ethnicity. Berbers have reached high positions in the social hierarchy across the Maghrib. Good examples are the former president of Algeria, Lyamine Zerual, and the former prime minister of Morocco, Driss Jeto. Nevertheless, Berberists who openly show their political orientations rarely reach high hierarchical positions. But, there are some exceptions, for example, Khalida Tomi, a feminist and Berberist militant, has been nominated as head of the Ministry of Communication in Algeria. In Libya, the Berbers were a key part of the rebel force that overthrew Muammar Gaddafi. In the 2011 Libyan Civil War, Berbers in the Nafusa Mountains were quick to revolt against the Gaddafi regime. The mountains became a stronghold of the rebel movement, and were a focal point of the conflict, with much fighting occurring between rebels and loyalists for control of the region. In Mali, the Tuareg, another Berber people, have armed themselves and are declaring a homeland in large swatches of the north. The Maghreb today is home to large Berber populations, who form the principal indigenous ancestry in the region. The Semitic ethnic presence in the region is mainly due to the Phoenicians, Jews, and Arab Bedouin Hilalians migratory movements which mixed in. However, the majority of Arabized Berbers, particularly in Morocco and Algeria, claim an Arabian heritage, this is a consequence of the Arab nationalism of the early 20th century. Regarding the remaining populations that speak a Berber language in the Maghrib, they account from 50% to 60% of the Moroccan population and from 15% to 35% of the Algerian population, 
besides smaller communities in Libya and Tunisia and very small groups in Egypt and Mauritania. Outside the Maghreb, the Tuareg in Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso number some 850,000, 1,620,000 and 50,000 respectively although Tuaregs are Berber people with a traditionally nomadic pastoralist lifestyle. They are the principal inhabitants of the vast Sahara Desert. Prominent Berber groups include the Kabyles from Kabylia, a historical autonomous region of northern Algeria, who number about 6 million and have kept, to a large degree, their original language and society, and the Shala or Klu in High and Anti Atlas and South Valley of Morocco, numbering about 8 million. Other groups include the Rifians of northern Morocco, the Chewi people of eastern Algeria, the Chen Oues in western Algeria, the Berbers of Tripolitania and the Tuaregs of the Sahara scattered through several countries. Though stereotyped in Europe and North America as nomads, most Berbers were in fact traditionally farmers, living in mountains relatively close to the Mediterranean coast or oasis dwellers, such as the Siwa of Egypt, but the Tuareg and Zanaga of the southern Sahara were almost wholly nomadic. Some groups, such as the Chewis, practiced transhumans. Political tensions have arisen between some Berber groups and North African governments over the past few decades, partly over linguistic and social issues, for instance, in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya, giving children Berber names was banned. The regime of Muammar Gaddafi in Libya also banned the teaching of Berber languages, and the leader warned Berber leaders in a 2008 diplomatic cable leaked by WikiLeaks you can call yourselves whatever you want inside your homes Berbers, children of Satan whatever but you are only Libyans when you leave your homes. As a result of the persecution suffered under Gaddafi's rule, many Berbers joined the Libyan opposition in the 2011 Libyan Civil War. Berbers set up communities in Mauritania near the Malian imperial capital of Timbuktu. According to an estimate from 2004, there were about 2.2 million Berber immigrants in Europe, especially the Rifians in Belgium, the Netherlands and France and Algerians of Kabyles and Chewis heritage in France. The Berber languages form a branch of the Afro-Asiatic family. They thus descend from the Proto-Afro-Asiatic language. It is still disputed which branches of Afro-Asiatic diverged most recently from Berber but most linguists accept either Egyptian or Chadic. Berber languages are spoken by around 30 to 40 million people in Africa. These Berber speakers are mainly concentrated in Morocco and Algeria, followed by Mali, Niger, and Libya. Smaller Berber-speaking communities are also found as far east as Egypt, with the southwestern limit today at Burkina Faso. Tamazite is a generic name for all of the Berber languages. They consist of many closely related varieties slash dialects. Among these idioms are Rif, Kabyle, Shala, Sawi, Zanaga, Sanyaja, Tazayit, Tum, Abt, Nafuzi, and Tamashak, as well as the ancient Guanche language. Although most Maccabees are of Berber ancestry, only some scattered ethnicities succeeded in preserving Berber languages into modern times. As a legacy of the spread of Islam, the Berbers are now mostly Sunni Muslim. The Mozabite Berbers of the Saharan Mozabite Valley and Libyan Berbers in Nafusis and Zawara are primarily adherents of the Ibadi Muslim denomination. In antiquity, the Berber people adhered to the traditional Berber religion, prior to the arrival of Abrahamic faiths into North Africa. This traditional religion heavily emphasized ancestor veneration, polytheism, and animism. 
Many ancient Berber beliefs were developed locally, whereas others were influenced over time through contact with other traditional African religions, or borrowed during antiquity from the Punic religion, Judaism, Iberian mythology, and the Hellenistic religion. The most recent influence came from Islam and pre-Islamic Arab religion during the medieval period. Some of the ancient Berber beliefs still exist today subtly within the Berber popular culture and tradition. Until the 1960s, there was also a significant Jewish Berber minority in Morocco, but emigration dramatically reduced their number to only a few hundred individuals. Following Christian missions, the Kabyle community in Algeria has a decent-sized recently constituted Christian minority, both Protestant and Roman Catholic, and a 2015 study estimates 380,000 Muslim Algerian converted to Christianity in Algeria. Whereas among the 8,000-40,000 Moroccans who have converted to Christianity in the last decade several Berbers are found, some of them explain their conversion as an attempt to go back to their Christian sources. Before the arrival of Islam into the region, most Berber groups were either Christian, Jewish or animist and a number of Berber theologians were important figures in the development of Western Christianity. In particular, the Berber Donatus Magnus was the founder of a Christian group known as the Donatists. The 4th century Catholic Church viewed the Donatists as heretics and the dispute led to a schism in the Church dividing North African Christians. They are directly related to Circumcellions, a sect that worked on disseminating the doctrine in North Africa by the force of the sword. Augustine of Hippo, scholars generally agree that Augustine and his family were Berbers, an ethnic group indigenous to North Africa, but that they were heavily Romanized, speaking only Latin at home as a matter of pride and dignity. He is recognized as a saint and a doctor of the Church by Roman Catholicism and the Anglican Communion and revered by the Reformed, he was an outspoken opponent of Donatism. Of all the Fathers of the Church, St. Augustine was the most admired and the most influential during the Middle Ages. Augustine was an outsider a native North African whose family was not Roman but Berber. He was a genius and intellectual giant. Many believe that Arius, another early Christian theologian who was deemed a heretic by the Christian Church, was of Libyan Berber descent. Another Berber cleric, Saint Adrian of Canterbury, travelled to England and played a significant role in its early medieval religious history. Lucius Quietus was the son of a Christian tribal lord from unconquered Mauritania. Lucius' father and his warriors had supported the Roman legions in their attempt to subdue Mauritania Ting Itana during Edemon's revolt in 40. Maesuna was a Romano-Moorish Christian king in Mauritania Caesarensis who is said to have encouraged the Byzantine general Solomon, the prefect of Africa, to launch an invasion of the Moorish kingdom of Numidia. Dihaya was a Berber Byzantine Christian religious and military leader who led indigenous resistance to Muslim conquest of the Maghrib, the region then known as Numidia, known as the Algeria today. She was born in the early 7th century and died around the end of the 7th century in modern Algeria. According to Al Maliki, she was said to have been accompanied in her travels by what the Arabs called an idol possibly an icon of the Virgin or one of the Christian saints. Quintus Septimius Florens Tertullianus, known as Tertullian, was a prolific early Christian author from Carthage in the Roman province of Africa and was the first Christian author to produce an extensive corpus of Latin Christian literature. He also was a notable early Christian apologist and a polemicist against heresy, including contemporary Christian Gnosticism. 
Tertullian has been called the father of Latin Christianity and the founder of Western theology. Sabellius, who was a 3rd century priest and theologian who most likely taught in Rome, may have been of African Berber descent. Basil and others call him a Libyan from Pentapolis, but this seems to rest on the fact that Pentapolis was a place where the teachings of Sabellius thrived. According to Dionysius of Alexandria, c. 260. What is known of Sabellius is drawn mostly from the polemical writings of his opponents. Fadma 8 Mansar, born in Tiza Hibal, Algeria, is the mother of writers Jean Amroush and Taus Amroush. Fadma, the illegitimate daughter of a widow, was born in a Kabylie village. Later, when she was with the sisters at 8 Manguelet Hospital, she converted to Roman Catholicism. She met another Kabyle Catholic convert, Antoine Belkissim Amrouge, whom she married in 1898. Ahmed E.S. Cycli, born in Jerba to a Berber family of the Sadwikish tribe was baptized a Christian under the name Peter was a eunuch and Kate of the Dewan of the Kingdom of Sicily during the reign of William I. His story was recorded by his Christian contemporaries Romwald Guarna and Hugo Falcandus from Sicily and the Muslim historian Ibn Khaldun. Brother Ratched, a Moroccan Christian convert from Islam whose father is a well-known respected Imam. He is one of the most outspoken converts in the world. He hosts a weekly live call-in show on Al Hayat channel where he compares Islam and Christianity as well as debating with Islamic scholars. Malika Ufkar is a Moroccan writer and former disappeared person. She is the daughter of General Mohamed Ufkar and a cousin of fellow Moroccan writer and actress Leela Shena. She and her siblings are converts from Islam to Catholicism, and she writes in her book. Stolen Lives, we had rejected Islam, which had brought us nothing good, and opted for Catholicism instead. Tarek Ibn Ziad, known in Spanish history and legend as Tarek El Tuirtu, was a Berber Muslim and Umayyad general who led the conquest of Visigothic Hispania in 711. He is considered to be one of the most important military commanders in Spanish history. He was initially the deputy of Musa ibn Nasser in North Africa, and was sent by his superior to launch the first thrust of an invasion of the Iberian Peninsula. Some claim that he was invited to intervene by the heirs of the Visigothic king, Witiza, in the Visigothic Civil War. On April 29, 711, the armies of Tarek landed at Gibraltar. Upon landing, Tarek is said to have burned his ships then made the following speech, well known in the Muslim world, to his soldiers. O oh people! There is nowhere to run away. The sea is behind you, and the enemy in front of you, there is nothing for you by God, except only sincerity and patience. Ziri Ibn Manad, founder of the Zirid dynasty in the Maghrib. Ziri Ibn Manad was a clan leader of the Berber Sanyaja tribe who, as an ally of the Fatimids, defeated the rebellion of Abu Yazid. His reward was the governorship of the western provinces an area that roughly corresponds with modern Algeria north of the Sahara. Yusuf ibn Tashfin was the Berber al-Moravid ruler in North Africa and al-Andalus. He took the title of Amir al-Muslimin after visiting the Caliph of Baghdad Amir al-Muminin and officially receiving his support. He was either a cousin or nephew of Abu Bakr ibn Umar, the founder of the al-Moravid dynasty. He united all of the Muslim dominions in the Iberian Peninsula to the Maghrib, after being called to the Al-Andalus by the Emir of Seville. 
Alfonso VI was defeated on October 23, 1086, at the Battle of Sagrajas, at the hands of Yusuf ibn Tashfin, and Abad III al-Mutamid. Yusuf bin Tashfin is the founder of the famous Moroccan city Marrakesh. He himself chose the place where it was built in 1070 and later made it the capital of his empire. Until then, the Almoravids had been desert nomads, but the new capital marked their settling into a more urban way of life. Ibn Tumert, was a Berber religious teacher and leader from the Masmuda tribe who spiritually founded the Almohad dynasty. He is also known as El Mahdi in reference to his prophesied redeeming. In 1125, he began an open revolt against all more avid rule. The name Ibn Tumert comes from the Berber language and means son of the earth. Abu Yaqub Yusuf was the second Almohad Caliph. He reigned from 1163 until 1184. He had the Giralda in Seville built. Abu Yaqub al-Mustansir Yusuf II Caliph of Maghrib from 1213 until his death. The son of the previous Caliph, Muhammad and Nasir, Yusuf assumed the throne following his father's death, at the age of only 16 years. Al-Biziri was a Sanyaja Berber Sufi poet belonging to the Shad Hilaya order being direct disciple of Sheikh Abul Abbas al-Mursi. Ibn Batida was a Berber Sunni Islamic scholar and jurisprudent from the Maliki Madhab, and at times a Qadi or judge. However, he is best known as a traveller and explorer whose account documents his travels and excursions over a period of almost 30 years, covering some 117,000 kilometers. These journeys covered almost the entirety of the known Islamic realm, extending from modern West Africa to Pakistan, India, the Maldives, Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, and China, a distance readily surpassing that of his predecessor near-contemporary Marco Polo. Muhammad al-Jajali, from the tribe of Jajala which was settled in the Sioux area of Maghrib between the Atlantic Ocean and the Atlas Mountains. He is most famous for compiling the Dala il al qurai an extremely popular Muslim prayer book. Muhammad Azal was a religious Berber poet. He is considered the most important author of the Shala literary tradition. He was born around 1670 in the village of al kasaba in the region of Su, Maghrib, and died in 1748-9. Gadamese Dauga Kasbah of the Udayas in Rabat Walled Citadel of Shala, the core of Sale Bab Agnehu Marrakesh All more avid sophisticated architecture Kautobia, Marrakesh Medersab Wanyania of Meknes Eight Ben Hadu Building interior in Algiers Kautobia Mosque in Marrakesh Great Mosque of Algiers Traditional architecture of Gardea Algeria Moroccan Mosque Bab Mansair in Morocco Torre del Oro, Seville, Berber dynasty of the Almohads Agdal Wall, and Gardens, Meknes Architecture of Bijaya, Algeria Great Mosque of Sale Ifrinid Mosque of Kasba Tadla Kesar Old Sultan, Tunisia Gurfa Interior Tlemcen, Algeria Aurica, Berber Village, Morocco Adrar Buildings, Algeria Siwa Oasis in Egypt Berber Village, Atlas Mountains
traditional Berber house. Cave Homes Mat Mata, Tunisia Mosque in Morocco Mansoura Mosque Entrance Torre de la Plata, Seville, Almohad Dynasty Gibraltar Castle Mansoura Mosque, Tlemcen Hamadid Kalat, Algeria Great Mosque of Algiers Almohad minus 1899 picture. Zionid interior architecture. A Tirgit village, Morocco. Hassan Tower, Morocco. Agadir, Medina. House in Algiers. Modeling of Tin Hinan tomb in Algerian Sahara. Tomb of Juba II and Selina in Tipaza Province, Algeria. Tomb of Masinissa. The Madrasan Tomb, near Lombaisis. The Jedars Tombs in Tiarat. Marinid Tombs in Fes. Almoravids Castle in Segovia. Alcazaba of Malaga in Malaga. Castillo de Almodovar del Rio in Córdoba Giralda in Seville Traditionally, men take care of livestock. They migrate by following the natural cycle of grazing, and seeking water and shelter. They are thus assured with an abundance of wool, cotton, and plants used for dyeing. For their part, women look after the family and handicrafts first for their personal use, and secondly for sale in the souks in their locality. The Berber tribes traditionally weave kilims. The tapestry maintains the traditional appearance and distinctiveness of the region of origin of each tribe, which has in effect its own repertoire of drawings. The textile of plain weave is represented by a wide variety of stripes, and more rarely by geometrical patterns such as triangles and diamonds. Additional decorations such as sequins or fringes, are typical of Berber weave in Morocco. The nomadic and semi-nomadic lifestyle of the Berbers is very suitable for weaving kilims. The customs and traditions differ from one region to another. The social structure of the Berbers is tribal. A leader is appointed to command the tribe. In the Middle Ages, many women had the power to govern, such as Kahina and Tazufert Fatma in the Oras Mountains, Tin Hinan in the Hagar, Kemsi in Aitiraden, Fatma Tazufert in the Oras. Lala Fatma Ensumer was a Berber woman in Kabylie who fought against the French. The majority of Berber tribes currently have men as heads of the tribe. In Algeria, the El Kaysur platform in Kabylie gives tribes the right to fine criminal offenders. In areas of Chewi, tribal leaders enact sanctions against criminals. The Tuareg have a king who decides the fate of the tribe and is known as Amenical. It is a very hierarchical society. The Mozabites are governed by the spiritual leaders of Ibadism. The Mozabites lead communal lives. During the crisis of Bariani, the heads of each tribe resolved the problem and began talks to end the crisis between the Maliki and Ibadite movements. In marriages, the man selects the woman, and depending on the tribe, the family often makes the decision. In comparison, in the Tuareg culture, the woman chooses her future husband. The rights of marriage are different for each tribe. Families are either patriarchal or matriarchal, according to the tribe. Berber Hand Decoration Detail of a traditional Berber carpet Algerian Berber Calendar Ancient Tifanac scripts in Algeria Jewelry, Kabyle, Algeria Berber cuisine is a traditional cuisine which has evolved little over time. 
it differs from one area to another within and among Berber groups. Principal Berber foods are Although they are the original inhabitants of North Africa, and in spite of numerous incursions by Phoenicians, Romans, Byzantines, Ottomans, and French, Berber groups lived in very contained communities. Having been subject to limited external influences, these populations lived free from acculturating factors. Customized tagine Couscous dish Turkey tagine Berber music the traditional music of North Africa, has a wide variety of regional styles. The best known are the Moroccan music, the popular Gaspa, Kabyle and Cha'i music of Algeria, and the widespread Tuareg music of Burkina Faso, Niger and Mali. The instruments used are the bender and gambra, which accompanying songs and dances. Traditional Kabyle music consists of vocalists accompanied by a rhythm section, consisting of E, bell and bender, and a melody section, consisting of a gaita and a jwag. Kabyle music has been popular in France since the 1930s, when it was played at cafés. As it evolved, Western string instruments and Arab musical conventions, like large backing orchestras, were added. By the time Rai, a style of Algerian popular music, became popular in France and elsewhere in Europe, Kabyle artists began using less traditional instruments and formats. Hassan Zermany's All Electric Takfarinas and Abdeli's work with Peter Gabriel's Real World helped bring Kabyle music to new audiences while the murder of Matoabluns inspired many Kabyles to rally around their popular musicians. There are three varieties of Berber folk music, village and ritual music, and the music performed by professional musicians. Village music is performed collectively for dancing, including ahidas and ahaik dances. Instruments include flutes and drums. These dances begin with a chanted prayer. Ritual music is performed at regular ceremonies to celebrate marriages and other important life events. Ritual music is also used as protection against evil spirits. Professional musicians travel in groups of four, led by a poet. The Amidaz performs improvised poems, often accompanied by drums and rabab along with Abu Anim who plays a double clarinet and acts as a clown for the group. The Klua Berbers have professional musicians called Ru'as who play in ensembles consisting of lutes, rabobs, and cymbals, with any number of vocalists. The leader, or Reyes, leads the choreography and music of the group. These performances begin with an instrumental astra on rabob which also gives the notes of the melody which follows. The next phase is the amarg, or sung poetry, and then amusu, a danced overture, tamust, an energetic song, aberdog, a dance, and finally the rhythmically swift debate. There is some variation in the presentation of the order, but the astra always begins, and the debate always ends. Traditional Berber festivals include Fantasia, Imilchil Marriage Festival and Udain and Acre. He most ruinous tribute was imposed and exacted with unsparing rigour from the subject native states, and no slight one either from the cognate Phoenician states. Hence arose that universal disaffection, or rather that deadly hatred, on the part of her foreign subjects and even of the Phoenician dependencies, toward Carthage, on which every invader of Africa could safely count as his surest support. This was the fundamental, the ineradicable weakness of the Carthaginian Empire.